Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Samuel, the 10th through the 20th verses. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants and no razors shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you have a drunk, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. And then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grants the petition you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went her way and ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel. For she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of God. May we be inspired. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Remove any obstacle from me that interferes from hearing the truth. 
of your word. My eight-year-old granddaughter asked me if God is too busy to hear her prayers. Her friend, Timmy, caught COVID and eventually entered the hospital. She prayed that he would not go to the hospital. Happily, I can say Timmy is back home. However, her prayer was that Timmy not be admitted to the hospital. If we don't believe that God will actually make things different based on our prayers, then what is the point? Why do we pray? It's a fair question. And I immediately thought of my harrowing flight, a flight to Denver that experienced turbulence all the way from Chicago to Denver. Had I believed, as I said, my prayer over and over, that it actually had the power to keep our plane up. And if not, why was I doing it? This question was heavily on my mind on Friday as I frantically follow news reports of the violence in and around the United States of America, and then learn of the violent acts in Chautauqua, New York, and Cincinnati, Ohio. But why do we pray? What is the power of prayer? To be honest, Hannah's story is basically a theological awkward, complex, hazardous situation when it, when it comes to these questions. But I couldn't read this scripture this week without bringing those questions to the table. An uncritical reading might lead us to all sorts of conclusions about God and about prayer. We might conclude, for instance, that faithful prayer always, always leads to the outcome one hopes for. We might also conclude that God rewards faithful women with children, and thus that a lack of children counts as faithlessness. We might conclude that the value of a woman rests in her ability to reproduce and that her respectability as a person of faith rests in her desire to reproduce. And these conclusions are what make this text dangerous. After all, we know that a person's ability or desire to procreate has nothing to do with their value, their faithful, faithfulness, or how beloved they are by God. We also reject the idea of a God who arbitrarily doles out punishment and reward. We have an entire Bible, the life and grace of God, of Jesus, and our own experiences to tell us that these conclusions about God and about why we pray don't reflect who God really is or what our faith is really about. These ideas define the time in which Hannah lived. But the lesson her story has to teach us about prayer speaks far beyond her oppressive context. Hannah lived at a time when her entire value as a human being centered on her ability to give birth, birth to boys. Even though her husband Elkanah loved her, the narrative of Hannah's time told her that her closed womb 
made her literally worth nothing. She was constantly reminded of that narrative of her worthlessness by very fertile other wife, Panina. And she is even handed this narrative by Eli, the priest. I think this is most remarkable or what is most remarkable about Hannah's story isn't that God answered her prayer. The incredible part is that Hannah prayed in the first place. She had no reason in her paradigm to believe that God cares for her. She had no reason to believe that she is worth a better situation than the one she has, or even that the world can be better. She is surrounded by a narrative of brokenness and pain and indignity. But Hannah believes in something else. Hannah believes in the love of God. She believes that the world God desires for her and for everyone is different from the world she lives in. And so she cries out to her God. She cries out in prayer, calling for that different world, a world defined by the love of a faithful and just God who embraces all people. Her words of anguish and anger, her vocal and physical rejection of the broken paradigm around her vibrates along the cord of her own faith that ties her back to her creator like a tin can telephone line between the world that is and the kingdom of God that is yet to be. And though Hannah's faithfulness in prayer begins in the silence of her heart and in the quiet words mild in the temple, it moves beyond her. It compels her to stand up against her circumstances and even to stand up to the priest that would deny the truth of her own belovedness. Hannah prays first with her heart, then with her words, and finally her whole self, body and soul, engaged in crying out to God for a different and better reality. Hannah prayer offers a faithful disruption to the unjust world around her. Her words of lament and hope offer a counter narrative to the one her sinful world hands her. Her cries to God remind her that there is a different world that she believes in and belongs to rather than the world that doesn't believe in her. And this reminder compels her forward, drawing ever nearer to that better world. Thus, I believe this, what Hannah does is the power of prayer. This is why we pray. When I picture Hannah crying out in that temple, I imagine her engaging in a holy filibuster. I see her like Jimmy Stewart in the classic movie, Myth, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I'm probably showing my age right now, but some of you may remember that. In that movie, James Stewart plays an idealistic junior senator who gets tangled up in the corrupt political system that tries to destroy him. On the verge of being expelled from Congress on false claims of his own worthlessness, Smith engages in a 24-hour 
filibuster, holding back the tide of corruption and injustice that threatens to drown him with whatever words he can summon about hope, justice, and a better world. Unlike Hannah, neither Smith, unlike Hannah, neither Smith found immediate success in his call for a different reality. Smith faints just after vowing to continue his filibuster. The remarkable power of his actions, however, echoes Hannah's own faithfulness. In the face of a broken world, of a destructive, unjust narrative, he claimed a different story, a better and more just narrative, and refused to relinquish hold on the world he really believed in. His voice, his in-body calls for justice, compelled faith and justice in others, and if only in, a, in small ways, move the world. Hannah refused to accept the story she is told by everyone around her. She drowns it out in prayer and her prayer tells a different story, a holy story of the kingdom of God where she is beloved and all people are sacred and justice rolls down like water. We don't pray so that God will manipulate our circumstances according to our direction. We pray because we believe that things can be different and better than they are. We pray to remind ourselves and one another that this broken narrative is not the end of the story, that this broken world is not the one we belong to. We pray to disrupt our destructive paradigm and filibuster against the tide of pain and injustice that threatens to overwhelm us. And we pray not just with silent words, but also with our whole selves, standing firmly in the truth of a God who loves us and calls us to justice and mercy and faith. If this is the power of prayer, to draw us ever closer to our God and God's kingdom, then I think Hannah's story offers us much hope. Though I spent much time this past week thinking about the value of Hannah's prayer, it is not the first time her story and her prayer has been inspiring to me in the face of life turbulence and hard questions. Several years ago, and I mean several years ago, I attended a retreat in Franklin, North Carolina for emerging black women pastors in the UCC. The narrative I had been taught told me that my identity as a black woman living in America made me unworthy to be a minister, unworthy of God's love and call on my life. At the retreat, I was surrounded by others struggling against the same painful paradigm. On one of the nights of the retreat, a recently ordained Asian Indian pastor preached a sermon on this same scripture. She spoke about Hannah's courage to stand in her full truth and call for a better world. And at her sermon's conclusion, she insisted she instructed us all to stand up together, 
crying out to God with our hearts and our words and our bodies, calling the better world we were made for into being. On the strength of that experience, I spoke my truth to my family just a few weeks later and faithfully continued my path to ordain ministry. I was moving to Connecticut where I did not know a soul. The struggle didn't end there and they haven't ended now. But that moment of embodied prayer and every moment of prayer since has reminded me of my call to tell a different story, a more holy story than the broken one of this world. All those years ago, on the day I summoned the courage to tell my truth, the word Hannah in Hebrew reminds me why we cry out to God, why we pray with our hearts and our bodies and our lives, and to remember what the power of that prayer is whenever anyone in our beloved community of the faithful. The church needs encouragement. I simply say to you, each of you stand and remember Hannah. I come to you this morning to say, the power of your prayer is the vibration along a telephone wire of our faith back to God who made us and forward to the world God made us for. The power of our prayer is to tell a different story, a better story, and to disrupt the brokenness around us. We don't pray so that God will change our circumstances to make us more worthy, more valuable, more loved. We pray to remember that regardless of our circumstances, we are already worthwhile and valued and loved by God, all of us. And to reject with all that we believe and all that we are, any world and any story that says otherwise. We pray with our words and our hands and our feet. And yes, our prayer have power. We pray when we look at injustice and pain and mess around us and cry out in our temples and synagogue and churches, our schools and our cities for something better. We pray when we choose to believe in the possibility of hope and grace in the face of pain and despair. We pray when we cry out to our ministers and our leaders and above all to our God saying, women have equal value and worth. Asian immigrants deserve justice and in marginalized persons matter in the face of unjust practices. Poverty needs to be eradicated. Climate change needs to be addressed and churches are to innovate and adapt to the changing environment of a pandemic. We pray when we give our hearts and our hands to all the places in this world where violence goes without notice. When we stand in firm commitment to the story of God's love, we draw our world even closer to God's kingdom. God's kingdom come. God's image reflected in God's creation. God will be done and on earth as it is in heaven. So this day and every day with our hearts and our words and our bodies, let us pray 
to unite people of Christ and work for a more just world. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, expansive God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come haltingly into your presence, trying to figure out what we must do to be effective practitioners of prayer. We want to know how to ask so that we will receive how to knock so that the doors will open. We have allowed ourselves to be convinced that it is all dependent on us. Help us to let go. Today, we have heard the promises of your generosity and the sufficiency of your goodness and grace. Now we will try to turn ourselves around and to rely upon that generosity and sufficiency. Help us, O oh God, to make it around that corner. Free us to be able to receive at least some of what you so willingly offer us. Intermittently, we remember that we are blessed people. We would capture this moment to remember and to offer our sincere thank you for the fullness of our lives, for the glorious space that we occupy for the human interactions that enrich our days, for the calls to service, for the opportunities to be children of God in public places, for wholeness beyond health and joy beyond satisfaction. Hear, O oh God, our words of thankfulness, knowing how we are pained by the state of your world, we can hardly imagine your daily anguish. We want to work toward the presence of your justice and your peace. We want to help this shrinking planet become something better, more holy than it currently is. Take our intentions of this moment and sustain them so that our words and our body language may speak inclusivity and welcome so that our time and our energy may reflect a priority on healing new wounds and those of long standing, so that our minds may grasp your words of hope and translate them for those who know only despair. Work with us, Master Potter. Shape our understanding and our actions so that who you are will be re well reflected in this small piece of your work. Make us instruments of your peace, messengers of your abundance, and grand examples of what you can do with meager lumps of humanity. In the name of the creator of us all, we offer our prayers and thanks for those who have the courage not to hate. All the, of these prayers which flow from hearts which both ache and rejoice, we offer to you, Creator, and parent of us all. For, for whom else shall we go? In the silent recesses of your heart, offer your individual petitions to God. This is our prayer, and we offer it in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, who gave us a clear picture of what humanity can be. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray together. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer using the word trespasses. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
your offerings to this church bless the ministry and mission of the church. We are a people who give and we are a people who share. Please share generously in your offerings. I believe there's a basket at the uh, front of the church and that you may drop your offerings as you leave. Our closing hymn today is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's prepare our hearts and our mind for the benediction. May your journey through the deep questions of life bring you to a new moment of awareness. May you come to know that in every human event is a particle of the divine to which we can turn for meaning, for truth, and for the fullness of life. Go now in that confidence. For our God and Jesus Christ is with you. Amen.